Hello everyone, apologies for the delay. Um, we had some unexpected technical issues, um, as I'm sure you're all familiar with during these lockdown times. Um, thank you for joining this webinar hosted by the Aurelius Foundation about stoicism in elite sport. Um, our guest panelist today is Wimbledon champion, Pat Cash. Um, so feel free to type any questions or comments through the Q&A or chat functions on your Zoom toolbar at any time uh, throughout the next hour, and we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. Um, please also check out and follow our social channels. We've got Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Um, I hope you enjoy today's discussion, and now I'll hand over to Justin, founder of the foundation. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Holly. And it's a great pleasure to have Pat with us this afternoon for a chat of stoicism and elite sport and amongst other topics. One of the most important things if we reflect again on the, the foundation's goals and objectives is really to bring stoicism into the conversation with the target uh, audience of youth uh, at a certain age group, but also for all communities, whether it's in elite sport, business or otherwise. And to have broader conversations, yes, around stoicism and streams of stoicism, but also interesting topics uh, related to, to a life journey. So uh, this afternoon's uh, topic and discussion with Pat in a very informal way, uh, as good friends, as business partners and doing uh, various initiatives together is to share uh, some of those perspectives this afternoon. So before we get going, I thought uh, for most of the audience, they will know Pat, uh, but I thought it'd be good to show a couple of minutes of Pat's um, previous career as one of the most uh, successful tennis players on the planet in the last 25 years. So just a couple of minutes just to, to relive some of Pat's uh, expertise on the court.
we uh, we wanted to share some of that with uh, with the audience because it's it's rare sometimes to have the opportunity to um, have perspectives from someone who is absolutely at the peak of their career, but also uh, was one of the most elite in their field at that time. And so we're very pleased to have Pat here this afternoon. And it, obviously Pat is a fellow Australian. He's um, what was one of the best tennis players in the world in his day and has moved on to a very successful career in sports media and other business uh, activities uh, from time to time. And I'm very pleased that Pat has joined uh, with myself and uh, some other close associates to be a, a founder of a founder of the um, Aurelius Foundation. And this was us at the launch event in London earlier this year, right before lock lockdown. So Pat's heavily involved in, in the foundation and what we're trying to achieve, and also in the things around this foundation as far as the other charity work that we want to do over the next years as well. So this afternoon, we we kind of broke this down when Pat and I were talking about this, about four areas of discussion. Uh, one, I thought it might be interesting for Pat to share his thoughts around COVID-19 impact on the professional tennis world. Uh, that's a business and an, and an entertainment, entertainment arena. Uh, Pat's just been out to be in New York for the US Open and in Paris. And then we're going to move the conversation to, you know, elite sports and stoicism, particularly focusing around Pat's career and perspectives, but also with the great John Wooden, which will explain who John Wooden was in a moment. And then finish on, a, on a, an interesting topic about being in the zone as an athlete or and, and how that relates to the stoic, stoic in the calm. So Pat, welcome this afternoon. I thought we'd just open up and just get your impressions of, of COVID-19 effect on the tour as you saw it in Paris and New York and how you saw players and management and people deal with it. So welcome, Pat. We're so glad you could be with us this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, um, everybody uh, who was out there. Uh, I'm not sure about that, the video. Was that was the video fast motion to you as well? I, I didn't realize I moved that well. Um, I knew I was quick, but uh, <laughs> it, was, it, was, uh, it, was, it was nice to see some of those highlights. Uh, it's been a... It's been a um, Obviously, a few years since since though then, and uh, Justin uh, kicked my ass on on the court the other other day. That's how that's how bad it's going at the moment. <laughs> that's not <laughs> too bad for me. Or anything. I think you're a bit no, no. Uh, a bit generous in those comments, but no, no. It's, anyway, yeah, it's well, uh, interesting year. Uh, obviously, for me, but the, for the tennis world, for everybody, of course, uh, the tennis world started out relatively normal. Of course, Australian Open uh, kicked off. Uh, I was there, sort of. As um, as a uh, mainly as a, as a commentator then, um, and then I um, and then I decided to work with a young American player um, from uh, called Brandon Nakashima. Now Brandon is one of the top juniors in the world, so uh, I had a good close look at him uh, in February over in, in the U.S. and we made a plan, you know, to go through the year. Um, at that stage, uh, he he looked like the, as, as a top American player that he'd be getting into the these tournaments so um typically you know what i what i do as, as a coach when I mean, is you uh you know you try to analyze a player uh, you try and work out where you can help them um the, their, their weaknesses obviously uh but the the tricky thing about working on the in the in the tennis circuit is being able to uh, to be able to do that on the road, to be able to fix players' games and change things while they're, while they're in the, almost in the middle of tournaments. Um, and look, there's no, there's no doubt that that is, that is a very tricky, uh, a, 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 a skilled, uh, uh, it's, it's, a very, it's very tricky. <laughs> I, can't, I can't say, explain it probably better than that. Because you don't want the players to lose lose their confidence, um, and mainly they don't want to lose their confidence. Uh, and well, as you're chipping away, trying to change things, but they also have to learn to to, to trust you. So as uh, this is their career, and you know, the, okay, you might be known as a as a as a, as a player or a coach, and they may have some respect for you. But typically, what they are hearing when you're talking to them, and this is this in respect more so that for older players is that you hear, they're hearing their, all their other coaches in their head at the same time as you're talking to them. 
So, um, cut a long story story short, I had that, this conversation uh, today today with a player, and I said, um, you know, when I tell you when I tell you something, you have uh, you you have to understand. I have to understand that you may be tell have been told something completely different by somebody else, or this may bring up some emotions for you when you when you're um, when you're uh, you know I'm telling you something. Um, much like an ex-wife or, or, or your mum, when, when, when they, they might say, um, what's that bowl doing? What's that empty bowl doing there on, on the table? And it depends on who you are. You might be, oh, oh, yeah, um, oh yeah, I'll put that back later, sweetheart. Or it'd be like, you know, well, what are you trying to say? You know, you can be defensive. It can, you can do it any, all sorts of ways. And you, until you know your, your, your player, you don't really know how they're going to respond but there's so much back end in, to do with tennis players, damage, a lot of damage is there. So this, but this young player, of course, he hasn't had that much damage because he hasn't had much, that much experience. So it was, it was gung ho for us to get to go straight, straight into the, under the circuit and or straight onto the court and start, and start working on stuff. Just as I literally got out the week that London lo locked down. Um, and I, and, but I, I got to the US, I have US passport, thanks to my mum was born in America and handed that to me and I was born um, and I got, I got over there and we just started working we just started getting down we said this is the greatest opportunity I said to you I said to him I know you want to play tournaments I want to see you play tournaments as well but you've got a b and c and d that needs to be better and this is a rare really rare opportunity for any tennis player any sports person um, particularly tennis players, because we know the circuit goes for 11 months. You have a week off, a month off, or five, uh, five uh, six weeks off for men. Man, you put women, you have a little bit more. You have that the tour usually ends at the middle of October, as opposed to the middle of November. The first tournament starts the end of the end of the last week of the year or the first first week of the year. So there's very very little time to do anything. And here are, here we were. This kid really quite depressed about not being able to play, and I said, "Look, this is this is a great opportunity for you." So we worked, we worked our asses off for, for four months, to, and then then the tournament tour started opening up bit by bit in the U.S. Um, some of the players took the opportunity to 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 get some some matches, some sort of practice matches. Some of them didn't have any of them. Um, there was all sorts of you could hear, you know, uh, of course, I get very active on social media. Somebody like Stan Vavrinka, who, of course, is the three-time Grand Slam champion, is probably the the, uh, the, the lesser-known Swiss player. <laughs> There's another one that's out there, a bit better known. But he said he can't do anything. He's literally in Geneva, locked inside his flat for, for two months, cannot do a single thing. When we were out in California in a private tennis court, uh, and, and going and, and in, into a private gym. We we're doing incredible work. So everybody had, had their, their stories. Um, we went to the US Open. We had to be, and I think the number one thing for players is adaptability, uh, to, to, be able, to be adaptable and flexible. And we, we had to be adaptable and flexible. We didn't know when we would arrive. We had to stay in a hotel with all the other players. We had to get these things shoved up our nose every two days. Uh, we had to, we could not leave the hotel or the tennis center. So it was, uh, as soon as we walked out, there was a, literally a sign on the side of the hotel that said, if you walk past this area, you will be defaulted. You and your team will be uh, we removed from, from the, the tournament. So it was, it was, it was quite scary, but it was, it was quite, it was also quite interesting. And, and uh, you know, we just had to keep moving, moving on. And there was, and develop trust with this young player and, um, uh, and, and and try and do as well as we could. And, and he did pretty well. He got the second round of US Open and lost in four sets to, to uh, Zverev, who ended up uh, being in the final. So it was a very, very productive uh, six months. So it's quite interesting on that, just from a historic perspective. One, the uncontrollable is COVID. So there's nothing to, that could be changed there. The mindset had to move from depressed not playing into a re-engineering opportunity of, of his game. And then when the playing opportunity came back out, everyone in the whole microcosm of the professional circuit obviously had to adapt to a new whole piece. So 
those that probably performed better, I would make the assumption were, were more adaptable. And, and again, a very important starting point is the ability to see the situation for what it is and then move on accordingly. So look, great, uh, a great perspective there. One of the things that we wanted to talk about this afternoon about is something that you're quite passionate about is, is leadership and then team success and uh, athletic success or business success, anyone coming through. We've talked about John Wooden here. And for those who are listening, John Wooden was, is arguably the greatest college uh, you know, university coach in the United States and probably one of the greatest coaches ever. He was the coach of UCLA Bruins basketball team. He won 10 national championships during his, during his tenure, seven of those in a row. That's never been repeated, may never be repeated again. And he had a legacy both on the court and off the court, and it translates. And so what we did this afternoon is we've got this pyramid uh, of what John Wooten did and the things that he just, you know, digested over his, his both personal and professional career of, of success thing. And the reason we wanted to bring this out to the audience this afternoon was there's a lot of these traits here that are very stoic in nature in very nature. But before we go any further, I thought I've got a small, very small video here that kind of explains what and who John Wooden was. The man. Much has been written about what John Wooden did. I wanted to write a book about who John Wooden was. The champion. As a coach, he won a lot of games. As a man, he had his share of struggles. The teacher. We know of his triumphs, but what about his defeats? We know of his virtues, but what were his flaws? The coach. He was a simple man who lived through complicated times. A humble Midwesterner who was uncomfortable and often unhappy in the bright lights of Hollywood. The competitor. In these pages, you'll discover John Wooden as remembered by the people who knew him best. He was hard on his players as well as referees. He could be cold, he could be harsh. Make no mistake, he was tough. Really, really tough. The legend. Here, finally, is the comprehensive definitive biography of this bona fide American icon. He was arguably the greatest coach who ever lived. More important, he was a very good man. What a Coach's Life by Seth Davis, coming next January from Times Books. I personally had a, had a uh, I'm just gonna jump out of this in a second. I, I personally had a look at that, um, that book last night and uh, started to read through the few pages. And it was very interesting, some of the reflections there. And, and Pat, if we come back to, to this slide and just give some of your observations. Yeah. What I found interesting was, yeah. in the, even in that overview, he talks about virtue. Uh, he talks about the toughness and resilience, another key historic uh, virtue. Talks about being a good man and sometimes being a, a successful person or whatever people think you have to compromise. And he was a very humble Midwesterner as well, who didn't really like the, the limelight. And I think if we look at some of these, these key pyramid building blocks, so many of them uh, come back to relating to stoicism. And this, this piece of, this quote up the top right hand corner, Pat, success is a peace of mind, which is a direct result of self-satisfaction and knowing you made the effort to become the best of which you are capable of. And I think, in some ways in your career, Pat, as you related to this pyramid and your own success, how would you connect the two in terms of taking that journey to find that peace of mind, not only you know, primarily on the, on the competitive field, but the journey behind that? Yeah, it's, um, I, I, look, it's, it's interesting. This, this pyramid was something I wasn't really aware of at, at the time. Uh, I sort of become more aware of it as I've got into well, stoicism, sports psychology, and and coaching myself, but it's um, uh, I think you know the the great quote on the right hand side is what is and ironically 
in the side of the pyramid, he doesn't kind of cover a lot of this, but the, 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 fa the fact that knowing you did your best to become the best, the best that you would be cap capable of is, um, you know, is, is kind of what, um, is kind of what all you can expect from yourself and as a player or, or, or as a coach. And the pyramid that he's got there, I mean, there's obviously, the, the, there's the foundation there, which is the top three are very much sort of sports-based. If you look at the, the top three, uh, your conditioning, your skill, your team spirit, your poise under pressure, your confidence and competitive greatness. Okay, that, that kind of relates, that's, that's what happens. And that's what you need as, as an athlete. But the, the, the foundations are, are very, very stoic. And, and unfortunately, we can't quite see the things on the side. That in the top, rather right top uh, square, the top block there, you see faith and, uh, and patience. But it goes very much all, all, all the way down the side. On the right-hand side, they're, they're virtues. And I'll just go through them quickly because I don't think we can quite see them. But it's patience we can see there. Reliability, integrity honesty sincerity um i mean these are these are virtues he's a very very christian man he, he so he's these are sort of christian based um uh, virtues that he was i suppose given as a as a as a kid and the other side is very is more more on, on the competitive edge uh we can see faith which okay i won't get into that right at the moment but the other is a fight resourcefulness adaptability we've just talked about that and ambition. So that's very much, you know, so it's interesting to, to this, this pyramid, I think, um, whether directly or indirectly has affected, I would say almost every successful sporting franchise or sporting team. Now, you know, somebody like Alistair Alex Ferguson, who may be the most successful professional coach of, uh, that we've seen, uh, he, he may have done things, but he would have done things his own way, but they would be along the same sort of lines. Um, I had a great opportunity. I never, I haven't, you know, obviously know about Manchester United and his great run. And I had opportunity to meet Sir, Sir Alex Ferguson at Wimbledon last year uh, in the Royal Box. It was the first time I've actually been in the, been in the Royal Box. So I get, I get invited, but I'm usually commentating, so I can't go. But it, it was an interesting conversation because uh he'd had a couple of drinks and i hadn't had a couple of drinks because i had to go off commentating but i i wanted i said he said to me as you would get justin and i would get all the all the time what about this young australian guy who seems to be out of control and we're talking about nick kyrgios for you who don't follow tennis he's a super talented australian player uh who gets himself in a lot of trouble, but I mean, the talent is, is, is phenomenal, but there's, there's elements missing. You know, and, and, I, and he, I said, yeah, yeah. I said, what would you do in this situation? What would you do? Whoops, my lights just went out. Uh, what would you do in this situation? And, and he said, he would be off my team. He, he wouldn't last five minutes. So there were the certain principles that he, he, would, he would back as wooden backed on the right hand side, and and the first two rung, row, rows there of bricks in, in the pyramid, and particularly that the bottom two, uh, right in the middle, friendship, loyalty, and cooperation. Now, you know, you think, well, how how's that building a, a successful player? That friendship, loyal that cooperation. That's the same sort of stuff that I had to build with my player, the young 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 guy, the the, the first few few weeks. And that I'll have to do in, with future players, the enthusiasm and the uh, industriousness. Uh, you know, it comes with, you know, excitement and youth and and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a goal, of course. But they're very interesting and very particularly, uh, as I said, down the right hand side, which we can't quite see, but we, we can have a look. We look at you can have a look at at some stage. Very very stoic. And I think it's it's quite interesting here, Pat, which to change the the stream of the conversation. I think you touched on it really well here. This pyramid is, is something that you'd see in a, in a sporting organization or even a business organization and so forth. And you've, you've carved it up very well where it has the competitive edge and also the high value proposition uh, to build behavior, to build towards success. Mm -hmm. And the thing that when you and I were talking about this, I wanted to show you uh, what we want to discuss and, and share with the audience. This was something that 
you know, you shared with me recently, which I found very powerful, which was the, the wooden creed off, off the basketball court or off the, off the pitch, where he says to, him, to, to his audience that these seven principles are, uh, are the behaviours that build the lifestyle on the competitive court. And the reason I wanted to bring these up were because if we go, if you and I break these down from the field of expertise in, a, in, in building success or building constructive life or building a stoic life, that there are definite parallels straight over into stoic behaviors, direct parallels. So if we take the first one where Wooden is saying, be true to yourself, and then you start to look at stoic wisdom when it comes to uh, you know, these quotes where Marcus Rulis would say, it never ceases to amaze me we all love ourselves more than other people, but care more about their opinions than our own, which again, sends me the message, you've got to be true to yourself or we cannot choose our external circumstances, but we can always choose how to respond to them, which again is being true to yourself. Heroes are heroes because they're heroic in behavior, not because they weren't lost. And that's a very powerful quote. So you can see these things coming through, which comes back to the, the Wooten quote, quote of being as a creed, being true to yourself and over your career you must have been through various stages where you had to dig deep and say i've got to i've got to work through this both on and off the court yeah well there's um if anybody knows anything about my career knows know about all, all the injuries that, I, that i've had um which were uh, you know it seemed to be just compiling one after the other after the other uh, not long after i won you saw some of that the highlights in the videos there um, yeah, there was, um, my attitude, I mean, I certainly went through periods of depression to, certainly after about the, the fourth injury in a row that, that were on the back of each other, each, each one. Um, but you, you don't have, uh, you don't have an, op you don't have a, another option really than to, other than to get stuck in and, 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 and work away at it. And, um, that was um, the. Uh, I think one of the one of the, th the things that I I um, I remember having my uh, going and having a back scan just straight after the Australian Open one year. This was after I'd spent a year and a half getting my knee ready and then hurting the other knee. Uh, I came back in my second match. I had I back pain. I went and got a scan and I came back into the ho to the hotel. And as I came, came back in the hotel, hobbling, you know, hobbling along and there was my trainer, uh, you know, Ann Quinn, my, my, my physio, the doctor, and my wife uh, and the kids were all there and everybody was crying. And I went, oh, I hadn't heard the, I hadn't heard the result yet. <laughs> but you walk into the room and everybody's just, and I'm like, I guess it's not that good. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but you know, we, we laughed, I laughed about it. And I said, okay, well uh, let's go, let's get it done. Um, straight in, let's get the surgery done. Let's, let's crack on. And you know, that, that was sort of one of the, one of the things I suppose that was uh, well known for is just determination and to get in there, get, get stuck in and, and get things done and you have no mm -hmm. other way. And, and the wooden, you know, there's the wooden, uh, pyramid here, of course, the, the whole, the bun top bunch is all about determination and fight and, and uh, everything else that goes with it. I mean, you have no option than to fight and fight and fight again and, and continue to do that. And, it, and it's tiring. There's no doubt it's tiring And at the end of my career. And that's why we see so many players, athletes at the end, end of their careers, just exhausted and say, oh, you know what, I just want to sit down, have, have a beer and they get fat and they can hit the bottle or whatever it happens to be, or they can't walk. I mean, they're so often, I mean, we, we hear about it all the time. Guys just, they can't move because they push themselves right to the limit. And that's what you have to do as an athlete. It's not the healthiest, uh, not the healthiest thing, really. It sounds, sounds great. Sport's great in, in small doses, in, in medium-sized doses, but not, a, not, not uh, at that extreme levels. And I think some of the, the work the foundation would like to do in the future is capturing uh, professional athletes in any, in any uh, sport and giving them a sense of awareness about your background stoic thought and mindset so that when the playing and the cheering is over that there's a natural bridge to somewhere else and i do and i've seen it time and time again whether it be in tennis or otherwise where that safety net or that 
that uh, that understanding of what comes next or how to resolve what comes next, having that toolkit is uh, has been lacking. And I think those comments, you know, shape it every day. You touched on a little little bit there, Pat. This second wooden quote around make each day your masterpiece uh, from his perspective. And I think this really ties into one of the great Marcus Aurelius, you know, quotes in uh, book two, where about, you know, it really focuses here on what the requirement is on the day and nothing more or nothing less. And talking about focus on the right things at the right time and know, know how to filter distractions and I love this bit here, you know, you can approach each, each action as if it was your last, as if it was your last day, D dismissing the way with thought, the emotional recoil from the commands of reason, which in that example you just used there, you know, emotionally you could have retracted after such catastrophic in injuries, or you just have to push on. And Stoics have a resilience to them. Uh, this con quote continues in the desire to make an impression, to avoid that, the admiration of self, to avoid that. And another powerful beat here, to avoid the discontent with your life. When you're sitting there on a, on a, on a hotel, on a hospital bed or whatever it is with your family, you've got an injury. Uh, it looks to be very severe, but your mindset at that time is, look, I, I'm just, we've just got to get on. We've got to move forward. And I think taking every day and making it a masterpiece is a, is a really a key point. And then you were able to come back and, uh, and come back incredibly successfully. Well, I, th I think... This is this is one of the real lessons that I've had to learn in in my life is 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 to really to make each day and and this is isn't it so applicable right right now um, as we're coming in in the UK in the second lockdown, you know, it, it's 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 pretty it can be pretty depressing you know it's getting cold it's getting dark uh, you know and it's and what about what can I do well a lot of people at least they're getting back to work and get like, you can bring the kids to school and and that sort of stuff, but. Um, the one of the things that certainly has is, is, is helped me and and, uh, and is uh, in, in a form of med meditation. It's really meditation daily, daily meditation. And and what that does it it really blocks out the excess noise that's around you. And and boy, I mean, talk about having noise around us at the moment. I mean, if, if it's not COVID, it's Donald Trump and and whatever else uh, losing your job. Whatever it hap happens to be, there's it's um, family members. You know, I'm sure will be calling calling for money, uh, you know, to help. Uh, and and these are really interesting pressures. You know, where do you where do you sit on that? Where do you stand? What is what are your uh, what are your what are your virtues in in these circumstances in these situations? And you know, to be to sit there and say, okay, today I'm just going to take it. To, uh, today and I'm going to wake up in the morning and I'm going to do do my meditation and I'm just going to block everything off. If you pick up that phone and you start looking at that phone before you did the med your meditation, uh, it, yeah, it, it's gone really, isn't it? So it resets, it makes you, it calms you, it makes you able to, to have that perspective on the day and, and you can, you can, it's easy to, to, to take what's coming and and i know aurelius you know he well that was he, that's his, his um, meditations are all about i mean please speak more about that yeah no i think that ritual and having that ritual each day and having that reflection time first the, the calming of the spirit and then the reflection of the spirit uh through the spirit to what you're going into and i think you bring up a great point now more than ever with the uk lockdown again your selection spiraling to some sort of conclusion uh, there's so much going on and there's tremendous amounts of uncertainty to mo at the moment in society. So therefore you need to be able to stand on something. And stoicism always is trying to bring you back to a very steady set of repeatable techniques in life to make sure that, that, you're, that you're, you're staying firm. This next one, Pat, I think is really interesting around, Wheaton talks about helping others um, and creating friendships. And, and I think... Um, I really think it's one of the great joys and, and Marcus, you know, says it here where he's talking about say to yourself in the morning that today I'm going to meet people who are, this is probably one of Marcus most famous quotes that so many people lean on and think about all the time that despite 
people being what they are and they can be selfish and ungrateful and aggressive, treacherous, malicious, etc. But I've but we know that's what you're going to get anyway. So therefore, you know, despite that, still look to help others, still look to to do the right thing by people. And I like this quote of Seneca as well. You need to you need not to look about for the reward of a just deed. A just deed in itself offers still a greater return. And so, you know, interesting in your career as well that you know being on the tour, uh, being an individual athlete. And you had a very successful doubles career as well. So there was a lot of teamwork involved in that. But it must have been a, a different, uh, a difficult, uh, and one of the, and look, I had a very limited exposure to the tour when I was uh, uh, studying in my, my meager playing career. But one of the things I found on the, the tennis tour, I found it not a very friendly place, <laughs> in, 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 <laughs> to say the least. I, 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 I struggled with that because growing up in Queensland, I was a rugby player and a and a tennis player, I mean, and a, and a cricket cricket uh, athlete. I mean, I just loved all team sports and I ended up playing tennis reasonably to some sort of level. But when I got into look into the professional ranks, it, I, I found it really wasn't something for me. So, uh, you know, you 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 help everyone. Uh, I've never met someone who is so willing to give of his time and help people in, in so many different ways. You know, how did you navigate through your career trying to be the best that you you could be, which you certainly achieved despite injuries. And then at the same time, you know, trying to trying to navigate and be super competitive and try to help people on the way. Can you can you chat about that a little bit? Yeah, it's it, I'm, I'm, my penance is it's funny you, you said that because uh, uh, the, the men's circuit is slightly different than the ladies. The, the women's circuit is really unfriendly, really unfriendly. But the coaches on the men's the women's circuit know all this and they're usually men most of them are men um and they've been on the circuit and they're usually quite quite chummy but there's been stories i've heard uh of you know one of the coaches came a, a russian guy that and, and i won't say who the who the female russian player is who's quite famous who's just retired i won't mention her name but um she, you know, he was banned from talking to the other coaches or anybody um, even though there were these mates he grew up with uh, because she didn't want him to tell her any, any secrets. He says, I'm a professional. I'm not going to tell her, uh, the, the coach, about how to beat you. Are you kidding me? He said, no, no, you're banned from talking to him. And this is not an uncommon situation. Now, you know, where, where does the coach go from there? Do you say, excuse me? No, but, you know, I've got a, I've got a life outside of this and then my friend and I'm, you're not going to tell me what to do? Uh, maybe. There may be... The next day be like right you're fired uh, so that that could be so i'm i've gone from that player to that was who had all these secret i say say i call my ann quinn my secret weapon who is my fitness trainer dr ann quinn she was my secret weapon she used to do all it she created speed and agility exercises that we see on the football field on the tennis court uh also all sorts of act, uh, agility sports she invented these uh, 35 years ago or, or even longer. And uh, she was my secret weapon. And I used to go with her under the back court so nobody could see right in, behind somewhere. And we used to do all these movements, agility movements. I didn't want anybody to see them. So I was extremely competitive, incredibly competitive. But I was like you. I grew up playing sports and with team sports, which I loved. But then, you know, I have to play my best mate the next, the next day. I mean, it, it depends on you turn up to a tournament fly across the other side of the world. And this, this happened more than once. We literally flew across the side of the world, practiced together, flew across the other side of the world, went to in, in Rome. Uh, who do I play first round? You. We could have just stayed at home. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and then, you know, we're doubles partners. And, you know, what? It, it, so uh, I'm sort of paying penance for, for a lot of that now, I think. That I'm getting, getting paid back. But now it's, you know, it's about help, helping others. And... It's, I think, very much my, my Christian Catholic um, up, upbringing. And it, it was, I wouldn't say drilled into me, but it was certainly my father was always very generous. And it was always about trying to, trying to help somebody. Uh, but I was extremely selfish. I was, there's no doubt about it. I probably wasn't a very nice person to be around back in those days. But um, the, the, re the rewards 
now to to be able to give giving back are, uh, are phenomenal. And you know, I do that. Uh, you know, every day, every day, I'm giving I'm giving something back. Sometimes I'm paid for it. Sometimes I'm not. Um, the charity stuff that I do involved with it, it comes and goes. I have the energy sometimes for it, but I've got to be I got to give myself a bit of a break and say, okay, look, you know, if if this doesn't grab you right now. It will at some stage. I mean, you know, I'm involved in the Australian Indigenous community. I'm involved in youth uh, cha charities in, a, in, a, in Australia, uh, amongst other things, men's cancers and, and that, that sort of stuff. And I'm, I can't always give my time, but, um, you know, I can, I can from time to time. Yeah. No, great. And then Wooden talks here about drink deeply from the good books, especially the Bible. Now, as a foundation, we're not... A, you know, advocating anyone's faith, whatever anyone's faith persuasion is, is is up to is up to them. Um, we advocate stoicism as a as a way of thinking, and again, we're not suggesting that people, uh, um, you know, in any way, if they come across stoicism and it's something that that they resonate with, then that's fantastic, and they dive into it. But the thing I thought was interesting when you look at the the wooden piece of as it relates into how he found his strength and how what he conveyed to those teams. You know, I, I love which a quote everyone does know, you know, the unexamined life is not worth living, um, which Socrates said, um, and is is a very, very powerful, powerful quote as far as the Stoic is concerned. But then I we listed these books here, and I think even as you were going through a career, to, to us, it's about a continual journey and, and, a, and a desire to, whether it's all sorts of different philosophy or all sorts of, whether it's David Hume or Nitschke or Aurelius or Plato or Seneca, we're always advocating as Stoics that it's a continual journey of learning and refinement, which is again, not dissimilar as a professional athlete that over the years of your playing and getting to the highest level possible you know, at that stage of the tennis uh, uh, phenomena was, you know, you're continually refining, you're continually learning, you're continually improving. You were talking, just referencing there, you and Anne figured out a great, you know, what was revolutionary way to do speed exercise on the court. And you were looking to refine. So Stoics look to refine their character and so forth, but it does relate in principle that as an athlete, you're trying to refine all the time and continually improve. Well, this is, what, this is basically what we're doing. We, we're... The idea is to take focus off the end result. The, the end result comes, it becomes an end result. You build the wooden, you build the, those few blocks down the bottom of that wooden pyramid, the result is the end. That will, ha that will come, that will happen. Um, it's, 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 it's really is, uh, I mean, I, to, to examine yourself, um, uh, which is, I, as a coach, I will do for my player, but a pers as personally, uh, as I said, I, I, I came from sort of a, a very quiet kid from a from a very well, I'd say reasonably strict Christian Catholic upbringing, uh, to a, you know a wild independent guy who would say no no for an no no for an answer. I'd be you know ruthless in my competitiveness, to flipping the other way and and as so an awareness and and I realised that I had some some problems. I was the first one to put my hand up and say yeah I've got some real issues. But awareness, it was, it's just, um, a young guy came up to me at a tournament the other day. It was a small tournament when I was with the young American guy. And he's a French player and he, 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 was, he was a good, I suppose he was one of the top French juniors. I didn't really know him and he's sort of stuck in this, this level. And he said, Mr. Cash, can you give me some advice? Can you give me some, one, one bit of advice for my career? And, and you know, here's an opposition kid just, just randomly coming up to me. And I just sort of stopped and paused, and I just said, "I just said awareness," and that was as simple as that. I said, "You have to just be awareness for your for your life on court. You have to be aware of when you're when you're up and you're down, and you you're focused when you're not focused, when you, the opponent's beating you or this shot or that shot, uh, and then when you come off the court, it's the same thing. You have to have your own awareness of, of you know where where your situation is, where your life is at." Not everybody is supposed to be a Wimbledon champion. Not everybody is supposed to have a career in sport. Not everybody is supposed to have a career in a certain thing. There may be a time, but you have to have a uh, you have some some form of awareness, and that is through you know, an, a, a, through an examined life. Yeah, I think very well put. And and Aurelius talks about being always ready, 
for any situation that comes up and how you apply yourself into that situation, how you react. Five here, make, make friendship a fine art. And I thought Wooden's creed here, credo here uh, is very important um, for many, many reasons. And, and again, the Stoics talk about this very positively, very proactively. You don't develop courage by being happy in your relationships every day. You develop it by surviving difficult times and challenging adversity. So oh, great a relationship, you gotta work through that. You know, uh, that's a powerful quote. Um, I think this is one of the, most beautiful quotes from Epicurus, of all the means to ensure happiness throughout the whole life, by far the most important is the acquisition of friends. But again, you've got to be sensitive to it, work on friendships and stay with them through thick and thin. And then this last one here, associate with those who will make a better man of you or a better person of you, we really should say, welcome those whom you, you yourself can improve. The process is mutual for people to learn while they teach. And I think, you're a great advocate of that now and the way you give back to people and even some of the, the good people that you've met uh, recently that you've played tennis with, you know, our meager level with Len Rosso and David, Dave, uh, Dave Sellers, really great guys out here. They've all been so impressed with the way that you're so humble and have reached out to them and we look up to you in a certain way based on all your incredible achievements, but that grounding and building friendships and, you know, I think that over time, and you say about your competitive nature and you were so determined, but you've, what I've noticed, and I met you through Targs and Adrian Target, another really ter terrific guy who, was a, 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 who focuses on you know, trying to be the best person he can be every day, Anne Quinn. I met Anne through you, and, uh, or actually you through Anne, and then Anne came into a number of my businesses and did an incredible amount of work on best performance for our business on all levels. So, you know, you've got a, a great, you know, ability to take friends with you over the years as well. Yeah. And I think that has been a powerful, you know, where you sit in life right now is because of the relationships you have and the people who want to support you as well. Yeah, look, there's, there's no doubts. I mean, you don't need a whole lot of really close friends, but it is, um, you know, it's, it's and it's, it's amazing that through all, all of this, and and my, my father was my manager, and he he just used to pull me aside every once in a while, which I didn't like doing it. He, I didn't like it at all. Uh, and, and he used to say, he, he's, one of his famous ones was always about Maggie Thatcher, for some reason. He said, Maggie Thatcher had a whole lot of yes men in, your, in, in her cabinet. Said, I don't want to be that yes man. You know, you need to hear some 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 truths about it. And some of them were, hey, you're working too hard. You've got you got children. You got children, and you got a partner, and you, and that is the most important thing in the world. And so, you know, friendships. And that was that was drilled into me is that no matter how hard you work, and of course, you know, there's not always time for everybody. But but you know, these these friends. Isn't it funny at the end? It's when you read these lists of things of what people say on their on their deathbed, and it's always the same. It's like oh, I didn't. I wish I had more money. It's never. It's never that, is it? <laughs> I wish I had less time for my friend, less time and did more more things. Well, some maybe that might be. If I, but it's also you know I wish I'd spent more time with my kids and my family and my friends in the in the end, isn't it? I think and even it, when, you, when you look at uh, the um, the, the relationship, one of my favorite Stoic readings, which I refer to every day is Seneca and his letters to Lucilius. And, and those letters indicate a very different and evolving relationship over time, but you can tell they were very close and they must have uh, developed that relationship over time and kept that relationship over time in a very powerful way. And it sustains people over an extended period of their life. And as you say, I like, and I agree with your comment, you don't take everyone that you've ever met for the whole journey. You take a core through and, and that core evolves. And we've been lucky to have friends that, and a friendship that has sustained itself. Also quality friends. I mean, sometimes you've got to cut a, a, a bad friend out. I mean, there's, there's no harm in, in getting rid of a bad friend. And, and you know, it's not a long been lucky. I haven't had many of those, but if somebody is destructive and, and you're in a poison, poisonous relationship, 
um, you know, you can't be holding onto a codependent relationship like that. It's, and it's painful to let go, but you, you know, you have to be, and you know, this, you have to have a, a, a good people to go with you. That's right. And I think it's a great point because, you know, and both stoicism and when you read Aurelius and you read Seneca and you read uh, various voices, they're always telling and advising and cajoling to say, look, be careful who you surround yourself with mm. and be prepared to move on if there's a negative influence. And I think that's another powerful association as well. We've got two more, Pat, and then I've got one slide. We've got about 10 minutes left uh, or less based on uh, just based on timings, even though we started a little bit late. So I love this one from Wooten as well. And you've certainly touched on a little bit against uh, on this point this afternoon. But the Stoics talk about, you know, you, you have to prepare for difficult times. And it almost sometimes we always talk about from an American perspective previously about always looking on the positive side. I think the Stoics do a great job of also trying to look into what can go wrong so that you, you're preparing both sides of the coin. If it goes well, great. If it doesn't go as well. In your career, if you look at some of these quotes here, it's not that we have little time, but we waste that time. And that can be in how we prepare. There are the, the, the bottom quote here. There are more things likely to frighten us than there are to crush us. We suffer more from imagination and reality. And the mind is an anxious place if we allow it to be. Uh, being at the top level and winning Wimbledon and Wimbledon, you know, you know, the finals of the Australian Open and having such huge achievements in your field. You know, did you go into those events playing positively? Obviously, yes, but then preparing for the big finals from a mental perspective. What did that look like? The downside, how did you recover from downside? How did you, how, how would you think about that? Well, one of the, one of the uh, things that I did very well was visualization. That was something I, I worked on with my sports psychologist and, and he used to, we used to go up to the fam, in the family house at, uh, in, in Fulham, not that, very, that far from, from Wimbledon, 15 minutes away, 20 minutes away. And there was a spare bedroom up there and we used to go through and do visualization and he used to talk, talk through various things. Uh, it may be, depending on what the issue was, it might be talking about being relaxed on my forehand or being flowing on my serve. But all, also the other things that we, we would do, and particularly would work very, very well the night before I played the, my final, was to visualize all of the possible negative outcomes. And, and so, so when, that, when, that, when these things happened, they weren't a shock to me. So I sat there and we did our, we did our, our thing, but I, I sat there and watching and watched a movie, half thinking about the match, trying to, trying to forget about it. But, but I thought about walking out on the center court with the crowd roaring. I thought about, you know, you had to turn around and bow to the Royal family, all these, all these things. I did, uh, but if, if it was windy, if I got a bad line call, if I got a bad bounce, if Lendl, the opponent had made a, made a comeback, if I'd slipped over at the wrong time, if the crowd were really getting behind him and cheering him on and he was making a great comeback. I had to, I thought about every single, every single thing. And one of the, um, you know, one of the, the, the things that you, you could be prepared for that, but again, it was always about taking one, what's in front of you at the, t at the time and dealing with that, the one thing at a time, and then resetting, reset, reset, deal with it again, then reset, deal with it again, reset, deal with it again. And that's what tennis players actually are very, very good at doing is, re is resetting. And, and to a certain extent, and I realized that at the, after my, uh, at the end of my career, um, with all the therapy that I had, my psychologist and whatever that would say, would well, you seem to be very happy? You can just reset and go on, but you don't actually sit and absorb what's gone on. You're just you can happy to move, move, and that was one of my things that I had to deal with in my life. But but um, you know to be able to 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 reset and and focus whatever the situation was was uh, obviously a, a, a something of the great sportsman. And great business people, successful people do very, very well. Whatever the whatever the situation is, yeah, sure, you have a bit of a think about what's going on, but you know, you've got to reset and keep going. Well, you just I think that is a very powerful thing you just said there. The night before winning the Wimbledon title, you went through a whole set of scenarios, very stoic in nature, of what clearly what you wanted to achieve, but also dealing with all the things that could upset you. Yeah. Seeing the negativity 
and playing through that. And I think it's extremely stoic in nature how to view future situations to take on, well, when it does happen, if it, this is as bad as it can be, then I'll be prepared to accept that situation and then move forward. So I think that's an incredibly powerful uh, piece here. The last one before we finish, almost, we've got one, one, other, one other topic I'd like to cover after this one, but pray for guidance and give your blessings every day. Wooden made that as a very important part of his creed every day. I know that you are very good at this and just spending the time with you both as we do our, our foundation and business interests and but playing tennis together and stuff. As you know, you know, I said it to you this week, we, we, I was fortunate to play with you at Queens this week again. And I'm like, every time I get on the course, like I just think this is a, such a remarkable opportunity for me and I enjoy it so much. And, and I, it, it, it's one of the few things in my life that I probably do when I'm there, I'm just concentrating on that versus every other thing that I'm trying to manage and being thankful. And I think one of the things that I, I've observed very closely with that you are a very thankful person about all the things that have happened to you, both good and bad, and you've taken those experiences and, and being thankful. And I think when you look back on your career, the way that it worked out, it was a remarkable career. And do you, how do you view it now, Pat, and your approach to gratitude now? Well, I honestly think I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Uh, there's not to say that I've had all the luck in the world by, a, by a, not even a stretch of the imagination. Um, but, you know, the, to, to be able to, to really, uh, again, reflect and be aware that of the, uh, that the bad things, that there's a reason for bad, there's a reason for bad things. And I, I think this is what, this is where Wooden, um, he has a, it's this through his Christianity, but it can be through anything. But it's it's a it's it's a, been able to um, hand over to a higher power or a more or a, uh, what uh, yeah I mean a higher power. There's every different religions would, would say in in a different way, but to let go or let, let higher power or or give you blessings, um, and in many ways that that takes away from the, from the pr from the pressure. In other words, to say. Um, you know, this is God's, this is God's path, or this is what, what, this is my, this is my chosen, chosen path. If I'm supposed to be a beggar in the streets in India, that's, that's what I'm supposed to, and, you know, the Hindus and the Buddhists deal with that very, very well. This is my, my path in life. My path in life was to get, you know, I've had to, uh, I've literally lost count. I think it's 12 surgeries I've had, uh, <laughs> maybe more, uh, lucky than none of them are too serious, but, um, you know, I think that that sort of handing over to a higher power or or uh, uh, being able to roll with it and to say, okay, this is this is part of my life, and I'm just going to have to have to deal with it. And uh, I'm going to, it's I'm lucky that I've I had this opportunity to feel to feel all the emotions that I have on this in this on this work in this world, um, and uh, which is happiness, sadness, all, all that sort of stuff, and to accept them. I didn't want. I didn't accept. I remember one. My, one of my therapists said to me, uh, "He said you, you've got to you got to have, accept the, the the happiness. You're not always going to be happy. If you can be happy sometimes, that's good." And I was like, "What? No, no, no! You've got to be happy all the time." And then I realized, "Shit! What am I expecting? I'm setting myself up for failure here. It's my serious failure." And that was a real awakening for me. Really? You, I mean, you can't always have happiness. No, you can't have happiness. There's other things in life as well. And these things will make you stronger. And as my favorite quote from my father, my, my late father, he always said to me when during these injuries, he said, the steel is tempered in the fire. In other words, what yeah. doesn't, what doesn't kill you will make you stronger. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a, I still remember that to, that to, to, this, to this day. And I actually have something tattooed on my arm to say this too shall pass. And this too shall pass with a rose on it. I can't quite show you everybody what's there, but with a rose on it. The rose is to smell the roses, to stop and be grateful. And I literally now, it's a habit of mine. When I go for a run around the streets, if I run past a rose bush, I will stop. Even if I'm halfway through my run, I'll stop and I'll smell the roses. And this just goes, and this too shall pass. The bad will pass, but the good will pass. Yeah. So, hey, enjoy your hit with Justin and, even if he somehow beats you with a sliced back end pass down the line <laughs> one mile an hour, still enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. Only because you've never seen it that slow. That's right. <laughs> uh, right. Pat, final topic, topic before we close out is um, 
I thought this is really interesting, a couple of things here. And there's, there's uh, when you talked to me to Wimbledon a few years ago, and I saw the great Kipling quote as well, but the zone, and and we, a lot of people talk about it in sports, and the and I building this bridge to the stoic inner calm. And people in sports or in business or in different things, when everything's going there well, they're giving a masterful presentation or they're interacting with their clients really well, or they're doing, having a great day and they're just, everything's following. And as an athlete at the very, very highest level, you being in that zone and if people don't understand it, but the zone is a state of supreme focus with, in athletes that in sport, uh, where they're just focusing almost in the most relaxed state at peak potential is when your mind is fully connected with you achieving your goal, so just hitting, you know, getting a hit. This is a baseball uh, connection, getting a hit or serving a beautiful ace or winning, a, winning the Wimbledon title. Athletes talk so much about performing in the zone and how it, how it feels so awesome. And then just as much, the goal of stoicism is to attain inner peace by overcoming adversity, practicing self-control, being conscious of our impulses, realizing our ephemeral nature and the short time that we have. And these, and you've touched on already, all these are all meditative practices that help them live within the nature and not against it. And I think that last bit, when you're in total cohesion as a, the most elite athlete winning the Wimbledon title, which when you won that title, you were clearly at your, your, your peak of your powers at that point. It's almost like being a stoic in the world that you, you're conquering your own internal demons and you're living a, a great life, albeit you're still overcoming adversity. And I liked your comment about it's not just going to be happy all the time, but I'd love to hear your commentary around the zone and how you felt like that. And then we can, we can tie it back to one of the things here at the bottom, which is the great Kipling great. You can meet with triumph and triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. And I think that's such an incredible process, athlete, business person, stoic nurse, teacher, whatever. The yeah. stoic of way gives you that, that, that understanding. Yeah, look, the the zone is is really uh, a, a a place a place where your nervous system is in 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 the right place, where outcomes uh, are not are not really uh, that important. That you are you're flowing. It's it's, it's it's called the flow, I suppose. The zone, uh, uh, a Zen state, and this is exactly what this, the Stoics are saying here. Uh, and, and that is, um, it's almost a, a meditative state where the, where the brain waves slow down just slightly. Um, and I've, I've been in it s several times throughout my career, but only once for an extended period of time. And it was to cut a long story short. This is a match that I had to win to get into the end of year championships. Um, it was the final of a tournament. And I was, uh, there was only top eight players getting to the final. I was number nine. I was playing number eight. We, whoever won this got into the final of the end of year championships, which was, which is a big, big deal. It was, a, for me, it was one of the, the, the highlights, the, the, the dreams of my career. I won the first set, it was best of five set final. I won the first set. I lost the next two sets. I was trying so hard and nothing was going right. And it's one stage I just, I just let go. And I went, and it's um, the next thing I remember is the, the round of applause. The next thing I remember was a round of applause when they cheered the other guy for winning a game. And I'm, not, I'm not joking when I say this. I don't remember anything other than the round of applause. I cheered and I looked around. I'd won 11 games in a straight. straight. It was six love, five love in the, into the fifth set, in the fifth set, and he won a game, five one. And, and, I, and I, I woke out, out, out of it. But there was a sense of letting go and that, that I didn't need to be trying anymore. So I was trying too hard and I had just had to, to let it flow. Um, one of the little things also here reflecting on what I believe Wooden didn't put in this pyramid, which is. He, he, he mentions it a, a little bit, but it's, it's the ju non-judgment. Now, it, it, he, he talks all, a lot about you know, the various aspects of you know, reliability, integrity, honesty, that sort of stuff, and going hard and all that sort of stuff. But you also have to be kind on yourself. And I think this is what we're so, we're particularly, I think, uh, the, the modern, the, these days, you, you have to be successful, otherwise you're, you, you, you're not you're not a success 
And I don't believe that is, that is the case at all. I think that what we should be trying to achieve is what the, sto the Stoicism, the Stoics are saying here is, is to attain inner peace. That is the goal, to be closer to our, to our, to our spirit, to be closer to our higher power, our God, or, or whatever it happens to be, or to be in a state of, of, of zone. That is the goal. That is the goal. And you cannot do that if you're criticizing yourself and you're judgmental all the time. And it's interesting, and I think wouldn't miss, miss that somehow. You have to, as a coach, as a mentor, as a, as, as a father, uh, as a partner, the last thing you, you, can, you can be, and, and may, maybe it's the toughest thing, I don't know, but this is something that I, being a, being a, a, a Christian, it's about forgiveness. And it is so much about let, being in, not, not forgiving that that per, the, the person who did this to you. Uh, yeah, sure, they're an asshole. Okay, well, what am I going to do about it? But forgiving yourself. Hey, you know, I just made an ass of myself there. You know, geez, I, you know, I did. Why did I do that? Oh my God, I, I just blew. I just blew the opportunity. Okay, forgiveness. Let, let be easy on yourself. And I think wouldn't did, didn't really cover that. You as a coach, you really need to be. You know, you, the last thing you want, but this was, this was back in that, those days where it was very uh, sort of uh, drill sergeant type of coaching. I don't know if he was, I don't know enough about it, but you know, it was, you do it this way, the other way, and this way, and you do that and you'll be successful. Do it my way or the highway. That yep. doesn't work. It doesn't work anymore. And you have to have an understanding and be, and the coaches and the businessmen, and you are, I think you're very good at that. I, I admire this greatly is that you have a great communication with your, your staff or your people or your team and you're approachable and they can approach you and they can approach you. Why? Because when they approach you with a problem, you don't go, oh, you fucking idiot. What are you doing? <laughs> you go, okay, okay, tell, talk to me. Okay, all right, all right, I understand where you are. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's see what we can do. Okay, don't worry, you know, be, be easy on yourself. How good is that? As opposed to being going, oh, yeah, yeah, you did what? Or oh. <laughs> well, that's the worst thing in the world as a, to, to hear as a, as, a, uh, as, a, as a student. Um, and as a tennis player, the players, no, no one harder on them than themselves. The last thing they want is me to be hard on them as well. Yeah. It's a great assessment. And you said a couple of things there, which ties back to stoicism, that the judgment of modern society in John Seller's recent book, he has a fantastic cha chapter on really practically showing how the Stoics should not judge. Now, some people would, would misconstrue that when you go back to Socrates' comment, life unexamined is and life not worth living. There's a difference between examination and assessment and judgment. They're two different buckets. And to be continually, and tennis players every second when the last point's over, they've got to reassess immediately, try not to judge, and then move forward into the environment. And it's exactly the same in life uh, or in business or whatever you're in. Moving then to, to close your path, I, I said I'd, these are the takeaways that we've pulled together. And I'll, I'll just go through this very quickly. Stoicism is a philosophy and it's very ancient and its values transcend you know, life management into all forms. You know, ethical and moral behavior is what the foundation is about personal outcomes, your achievement to your level, whatever that is you're trying to be in, in business and sport. It moves into all things. So whether we're talking ethical problems uh, uh, or life management, you can move into the elite athlete that you are and you can see all these stoic things coming through. Number two is, you know, we, we're, you and I are advocating stoicism to be looked at. We're not advocating that you have to do it by any means, but it, we're advocating it's worth a look and whether you decide to burn it. But if you don't want stoicism to ride the story of life, we're advocating that having some system, have whatever it is, it can be your system or your faith system or whatever it is. Number three there is really talking about the fact that in life, business or sport, any great endeavor is enhanced by a stoic belief in continual assessment, learning and refinement, not judgment. And I think you just summarized that really well in your previous, uh, previous co comment. And I think the ultimate stoic in sports and every single time you see an interview, every single game, every single coach, it's become part of this, this stoic uh, uh, attribute, this stoic value has become part of, part of um, sporting vernacular. And it doesn't matter. You can turn on the TV tonight and watch any single interview of a manager or a sports or an athlete they'll go 
you know, you just got to have that match. What are you going to do? Well, I'm not going to think about the future so much. I'm going to control the controllables today. So I, I always, when I hear that in these interviews, I think that is Stoicism's great gift to sport uh, and achievement that I'm going to control the controllables. But everything else, that's out of my out of my remit. So Pat, anything you'd comment to close us out here? Uh, well, just one little thing. I think when we're talking about the wooden and, and the Stoicism, there's there's another another reasonably famous person that that uh, has uh, these these sort of beliefs beliefs as well at, at, um, where where you the foundation of, of life will bring you the end result without you having to be so concerned about the end result and and that's uh, Mahatma Gandhi and now my, my, one of my I want to get this right so I'm looking here but your beliefs become your thoughts your thoughts become your words your words become your act your actions your actions become your habits, your habits become your values, and your values become your destiny. I mean, isn't that, that's, this is what, that's wooden really right, <laughs> right there. And it's, and stoicism as well. So it's, it's, um, it's some fantastic, um, uh, fantastic quotes here that we've gotten from fantastic information, Justin, and, and uh, the stoic is, it falls, I mean, it's before any of this stuff, stuff. So it, it is, it's fascinating. And I, I like your advice too. that advocate for a system of life management. Why not start it with stoicism? It's, 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 it's fantastic. Or mix it all up as I do. <laughs> but uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your time. No, look, terrific, Pat. I think um, it's been great to have you as a founder of the foundation. Uh, it's been great to, to bounce ideas off with you. Uh, it's been very enjoyable that in the next, as we go into uh, various things that we're going to build into the future. There's a few things that Pat and I decided that we, we thought were interesting for recommended readings. we we'll talk about wooden. These last two books are very interesting. The Inner Game of Tennis. Uh, I won't go into too much now, but it talks about the judgment side of things. And, and even though it's talking about tennis, it can talk, it's really talking about life. And the same with the Zen and Art of Motorcycle Mate. It's both great reads. And just in closing, we've got a webinar in two weeks uh, with Eve Riches which I'm very excited to bring to the foundation and uh, those who are interested. We've got another uh, more from the junior, from the, the youth generation coming through who are part of the foundation, Sukhrav and Dhruv are gonna do a very interesting presentation in a couple of weeks. Uh, later next year, if all things come through uh, the way they're hoping, uh, Pat and I and the other members of the foundation are looking to hold this global event. We'll keep you posted on that. And one last thing here, we are working, Pat, myself and some others, John Sellers, Tim LeBon, we're working on a Aurelius Foundation Stoic Wellness Module for Business, which we're looking to roll out into 2021 as well, uh, where it's a wellness program on Stoic principles coming into business and how we're going to actually measure it from the beginning of the week to the end of the week so people can get an awareness of Stoicism and have a wellness program invested in them by their company. So... I think that's it. Apologies to everyone that we were a little bit late today based on a technical issue. Really, once again, Pat, thanks so much for a fantastic uh, conversation this afternoon on stoicism in elite sport. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon in another Aurelius Foundation event. And uh, for everyone, have a, great, have a great weekend. And we look forward to seeing you again through another webinar at this stage of the game based on COVID um, in the next couple of weeks. Thanks everyone. Have a great, have a great weekend. Thanks, Pat.